So welcome everybody. I'm very happy to see so many people here. So sorry we have to get some more chairs. And of course, very welcome to Moa, Brazil. Uh, I can't say that Moa is new to the Institute since she has worked here longer than I have, since 2013. So maybe you're the second longest employee at the Institute. So Moa is a professor, associate professor of sociology and of course a research leader here at the Institute for Future Studies and also works at uh, Mela Dalen University. Uh, you received your PhD at Stockholm University in 2012. So a little short time before you came here. Very good. Uh, and where you studied ethnic discrimination in the labor market uh, with uh, Carly Grand as supervisor and Magnus Bygren, who is also the co-author of this paper, also here in the audience. And you have published a lot of papers on discrimination of different sorts and also now moved into looking into how artificial intelligence can either help or maybe not help when it comes to discrimination in the labor market and in other areas. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so today uh, I will present uh, some preliminary findings from uh, one of our current uh, research projects. Um, the title of this talk is uh, Employment Discrimination Based on Gender and Ethnicity and Its Impact on Gender Segregation in the Labour Market. Um, uh, evidence from an experimental study uh, in the Swedish labour market. Um, and I probably should have had intersectionality in the title because this uh, paper is really about intersectionality, but you will, you will see that uh, in a moment. Um, so what we're trying to do in this paper is that we're tying together several strands of research that has developed, perhaps not completely in isolation from each other, but I think more in isolation than I think they maybe should have, or at least it, we find it fruitful to sort of tie them together. Uh, and it's research on occupational gender segregation um, and research on intersectionality and labor market inequality and this field experiment literature on discrimination in the labor market, which is a method that I've been using, as Gustav said, uh, ever since my um, doctoral studies to sort of try and find, to sort of try and prove and document uh, ethnic discrimination. Uh, and in this talk, uh, the sort of the overarching questions or some perhaps the underlying questions uh, of this talk is, is the intersectional perspective relevant for explaining hiring and discrimination in Sweden? Uh, do employers contribute to gender segregation? Uh, and we also want to try and get at the why question uh, for these um, questions. And as I will return to later in this talk, the why question has been a bit of a weak spot in the field experiment literature. Uh, uh, the field experiment literature is very efficient in proving that discrimination happens, but uh, it's a little bit more empty on the why question. And we're trying to get at this in this paper, and I will return to how uh, during this talk. So uh, next I'm going to sort of briefly try and uh, sort of review these three, or say at least something about these three uh, literatures. Uh, of course, I cannot, each one of them would, you know, take one, at least one, um, one talk to, to thoroughly review. So I will just say a few words on each of that one of those to sort of introduce you to the kind of questions that we are interested in, in, in uh, answering uh, in this study. So I think uh, many of you are familiar to occupational gender segregation. I mean, uh, our labor markets are severely uh, segregated when it comes to occupational gender segregation. Most, I would say most occupations today are either female dense or female dominated or male dominated. There are also a couple of mixed uh, occupations, but most, most uh, occupations are, uh, I would say, uh, either female or male dominated. So we have this r really persistent uh, over time uh, segregation of men and women in the labor market. We don't work with the same work tasks uh, to a very large extent. Um, uh, this has been the case for a very long time and of course segregation is not a problem in itself. Uh, it's a problem because it uh, contributes to gender inequality. Uh, and why is that the case? Well of course because uh, female dense occupations are generally rewarded with less with lower wages uh, than male occupations. Uh, this has been the case for a long time. Uh, however, in recent decades there's been a shift and improvement 
which is that at least in some countries like Sweden, uh, mixed occupations actually have higher wages than uh, the male dominated um, occupations. But it's still the case that female dense occupations have the lowest wages. So we still have horizontal gender segregation contributing to gender inequality, but um, many high skilled occupations are gender mixed, uh, which is why we've seen this shift. Uh, but it's still a problem, uh, we can say that. Uh, and uh, to make it really to simplify it, there are two types of explanations to why we observe uh, this horizontal gender segregation. The first one, to speak like an economist, would be to say that it's the supply side factors, which is then basically that men and women sort of sort themselves into segregation by choosing uh, gender typical uh, educations and by choosing in the in the cases where you don't take an education to get your job you choose uh, a gender typical uh, uh, occupation right so it's like it's sort of like our fault that uh, that we have this gender segregation it's freely chosen in a sense of course you can nuance this explanation by saying that okay to what extent do we really choose right it's socialization uh, we're perhaps, perhaps being raised to believe that we are more suitable for, if you're a woman, you're raised to believe that you're more suitable for a certain type of work and so forth. But it's not the employers who are doing this. It's something else that's causing this, right? Um, and the other explanation is that it's uh, the demand side factors. It's the employers who feel the same way. And just as people choose uh, gender typical uh, occupations because they think it suits them, uh, employers discriminate uh, in a way so that we are sort of um, uh, so that they are also part of reproducing this pattern. So um, okay, employers in male occupations prefer men, and um, employers in female occupations prefer women for the same reason that they think that you know a specific gender is more suitable for this type of work. Um, I would say that. Um, the first, uh, the supply side factors have been uh, much more explored um, than the demand side factor in this uh, in this literature. And this is like one of our contributions also in, in today that we are looking at this. Uh, do employers contribute to segregation uh, in, in the sense that they are choosing a specific gender for for um, in their callbacks to to these applicants? Um, so you have these two kind of explanations. Um, Of course, uh, it's also quite possible that we observe the opposite pattern. Uh, I mean, policymakers have for quite some time tried to desegregate the la labor market. Uh, and they've tried to do this by various policies. Uh, for instance, in Sweden today, it's allowed to choose, if, if you have two applicants who have equal merits, you're actually, uh, it's, illegal, it's legal to prefer the underrepresented gender uh, in these cases for hiring. Uh, so it's actually sort of um, uh, legal to, to practice some type of gender compensation uh, in employment. Uh, and also there's been a, a lot of, uh, I mean, also among, among employers, you often see this in the job ads that they stress that they li prefer a gender mixed workforce and so forth. So it's absolutely possible that we will find the uh, reverse pattern. Uh, it's also quite thinkable that that maybe employers are not at all participating in this uh, gender segregation. Maybe they are trying to gender compensate. Um, actually, in my first um, one of my first um, correspondence audit, I did find some 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 patterns like that. Uh, not in all occupations, so it wasn't like super strong, but there was a tendency, at least in some occupations, of of, of some type of gender compensation going on. Uh, so I mean, we'll see. Uh, but but this is like one of the questions that we want to answer in this in this study. Do employers contribute to gender segregation by discriminating uh, male applicants in female dominated occupations and the other way around? And uh, so now I'm going to say a few words about the field experiment literature. I know that some of you are very well aware of what field experiments are and this specific type of uh, field experiment that I'm going to talk about today, which is the correspondence audit. But since I'm not assuming that all of you are very familiar with this method, I'm going to review it. Um, and in a minute, I'm also going to explain exactly how it works. Um, so the field experiment literature uh, has uh, persistently found uh, or consistently found um, ethnic labor discrimination using uh, this method. Um, 
in Sweden as well as in basically all countries where I've ever seen this method being used. Uh, so whatever country you, you, you study, like uh, the, the callback differences for majority and uh, minority individuals, you will find uh, a preference for uh, the majority or the dominant uh, ethnic group. It's not always the, ma you know, the majority, but the, the dominant uh, ethnic group. Uh, when it comes to gender um, discrimination, um, uh, th this has been a bit more of a puzzle because while we see this persistent gender inequality in society, these correspondence audits do not uh, in the same way sort of prove that gender discrimination is uh, an important factor in this, in this um, inequality because we don't see these large callback gaps between men and women, uh, at least not in the recent decades. Um, so, for instance, in Sweden, we have not seen this statistically significant difference between men and women. Um, and there was also a big European uh, comparative uh, study uh, that did not find these kind of differences either. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah. Uh, and and in the first couple of decades when this, uh, this literature was being introduced, like in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, there was a very strong focus on men. So whenever you were testing for discrimination, you were looking at, you were using male names uh, to, to test that. So, so there was really not any intersectional focus. Um, and uh, I guess the implicit, the implicit assumption was that, yeah, if it's there for men, it's probably going to be there for women too. But no one was really using uh, minority female names uh, in the, you know, when this uh, literature was first introduced. But since the 2000s, there's been an increasing interest for intersectional gender discrimination. So you're signaling both um, minority status and gender uh, in these studies. Um, and the evidence for uh, the relevance of an intersectional perspective has been quite mixed, I would say. Uh, there are studies like, uh, there was a large comparative study, I was mentioning that project, it's the Birke, Birke Lund and Distasia Larsen. Um, References, they actually found no significant uh, effect for uh, intersectionality in their study. So they did not find that minority men or women were significantly worse off uh, than the other. Uh, in the Swedish uh, or sort of Scandinavian context, the evidence has been a little bit more clear. Um, there's a Danish study, Dolan Krug, they found uh, a significant effect for that minority men were worse off in the labor market uh, than um, minority women. Uh, we found the tendency of this in the Swedish case too, but not for the whole sample. So also there, the evidence been a bit mixed. So yeah, so there's, you know, not a very clear picture there. Uh, which is also why we find it relevant to ask this question in this study, because we have a much bigger sample than we've had in the past. And we are also testing discrimination in more occupations than before. So we think that we're going to have this more comprehensive picture uh, this time. Right. Uh, and and if I think for order, in order for you to sort of uh, follow uh, uh, our questions and what we're looking for, I'm also going to sort of briefly introduce you to some some uh, uh, of the thoughts of the intersectional literature. Uh, and um, so the main, as I think many of you know, the, the main sort of point uh, wh when the intersectional literature was first sort of uh, phrased or, or like, you know, articulated was that uh, we're missing something very important when we look at gender ad and ethnicity separately because social identities are not perceived uh, one by one, uh, you, you perceive them simultaneously together. Uh, when, you, when you interact with somebody, you, 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 don't, you don't think, oh, this is a minority person, you think this is a minority man or this is a minority woman. I mean, you have a lot of social identities that you ex ascribe people implicitly or automatically all the time. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to just look at ethnic discrimination or, 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 or uh, gender discrimination. You have to look at them combined, otherwise you're missing something very important. Right. Um, and the sort of underlying uh, assumptions uh, of the intersectional literature is that uh, the sort of the cultural uh, gender norm uh, is androcentric. So like th 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 our societies uh, are sort of based around and uh, you know, androcentrism, that men is the norm that women deviate from, right? Uh, perhaps more so uh, in the past than today, but this is still the case, right? Uh, so women are the atypical gender. And when it comes to 
ethnicity or race, uh, there's ethnocentrism. So there's a typical ethnicity, which is the majority or, or the dominant group, and then other ethnicities sort of deviate from that, right? So the discussions, this is something that I think is sort of widely agreed upon, uh, but there's been some different differences and different ideas about, you know, how these multiple social identities generally impact life chances in our sort of everyday lives. And so they are traditionally, there were these two main approaches. Uh, the most sort of widespread well-known one is the multiple uh, or double burdens approach which sort of intuitively, uh, intuitively assumes that, th th that if you have two disadvantaged identities, uh, then you know, that's going to be a double or even multiple burden. So if you're a woman, that's the disadvantaged identity. Uh, and if you are a minority, that's a double disadvantage, right? Um, it's a very intuitive uh, idea. Uh, and if you're also then perhaps uh, you know, homosexual or you know, if you're old, then you have like maybe a triple or four quadruple <laughs> disadvantage, right? Um, and the other uh, sort of main idea, which might seem a bit more, in more unintuitive, is that uh, it's actually, you're actually worse off if you have a single non-typical identity. Uh, this is actually the heavier burden. Um, and this, this approach has been, mo I think, most uh, elaborately framed by Jim Sedanius and colleagues. Uh, he's um, uh, an evolutionary uh, psychologist uh, who sort of argued that um, if you look at the history and current societies is really a, a male competition about resources and reproduction. Uh, and minority women are hurt by this because they sort of liaison with minority men. Uh, so they are like, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a side effect. Uh, uh, the, the, the oppression of minority women is a side effect of this, of the, of the oppression against minority men. Uh, it's a quite controversial, but uh, there is there's some evidence supporting both of these uh, approaches, I would say. Um, we find in this article a more interesting approach to be one that combines these insights. Uh, a, a, pers a, pers a perspective that has been phrased in different ways by different scholars among them Cecilia Ridgway, um, where um, they talk about uh, that um, single and uh, double um, disadvantaged or non-typical identities comes with visibility and invisibility. And visibility and invisibility is sort of good and bad in different contexts. So for instance, uh, if you are then, if you carry a single uh, disadvantaged identity, then you have you are visible. Uh, so, for instance, being a minority man, you sort of represent the minority group. You're the representative of the minority group. And if you are uh, a majority woman, you are the ma you are the representative of gender, right? Uh, so, when you have a single uh, non-typical identity, you're visible, which means that when good things are happening, you're being recognized, you're being represented, you're being heard, you're being documented. Uh, your history is, writ is written and so forth, uh, which is a good thing. You know, uh, when there is like uh, good social policies, policies or social change is about to happen, being the representative is a good thing. Uh, whereas, um, when uh, and, and uh, you know, in the similar ma in the contrary manner, then if you're invisible, if you're the minority women, uh, you're not being heard and seen when social change and good things are happening. This is something that many feminist black scholars uh, complained about uh, in the 60s like, and, and 70s, like Bell Hooks, uh, who said that when, uh, when black people are being talked about, uh, they, talk, they think about men, uh, and when women are being talked about, they think about white women. Uh, so nobody thinks about black women. This is like the negative invisibility. But when bad things are happening, uh, then, then negative visibility uh, it becomes an issue for the single non-typical identity. Uh, if you are my, so then when you are the representative uh, of an identity, uh, a social identity, you are the primary target of hostility, racism, sexism, homophobia, or whatever it is that is the, the hostility, right? Um, so, so visibility comes with positive and negative, and invisibility comes with positive and negative and comparatively positive, <laughs> in the sense when we're talking about racism, you know, it's not like you're you're very good off, but at least you're less bad off than, than the, the non-typical identity.
Um, and we we sort of uh, find this this perspective uh, relevant, uh, and we ex we 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 expand on this in the sense that we first of all we want to look at is the labor market a case of good or bad visibility? Because uh, it's not completely clear what's going to happen when you apply for jobs, right? If this visibility or non-visibility is is a, is a better thing. Uh, and we also expand on this pers perspective by, by sort of looking at so so the the ins some intersectional scholars seem to uh, imply that you know the labor ma market is a d is a male sphere but actually because it's so seg segregated you can actually uh, think that maybe there is a female sphere and a, a male sphere and that maybe you know women are you know the typical gender in the female sphere right and men are maybe only the typical gender in the male sphere so we want to expand about this in the way and see what happens when we apply for jobs uh, uh, in these sectors. Uh, sorry, yeah. So these are our sort of specific. Uh, I was uh, mentioning some some sort of more overarching questions earlier. These are like our specific questions that we ask in this study. First, is ethnic discrimination gendered? Uh, so we say different for men and women. Uh, are applicants re rewarded for occupational gender conformity? And does signaling stereotypical gender and Swedish last foreign background impact uh, callbacks? And I'm going to explain uh, this third question for you uh, in a minute. So, yeah, we're using the correspondence audit approach. And for those of you who are unfamiliar to it, uh, it is that you, it's, an, it's a sort of natural experiment or field experiment where you send job applications from fictitious people to job announcements. Uh, and you measure discrimination in callback differences. So you hold everything equal in these applications. So the only thing that could really impact uh, a difference between these categories is employee discrimination, because you know it's the same uh, applications. Sometimes they have a Swedish sounding name, sometimes a foreign sounding, sometimes a male, sometimes a, a foreign sounding and so forth. Um, and we're using, uh, and the way that we do this in this correspondence audit is that we signal the things that we want to measure discrimination against uh, in different ways. Uh, and because we're looking at uh, gender and ethnicity, we are signaling that in first the names, which is the traditional way to do it. Uh, so we have typical female, like non, non ambiguously female and male and foreign sounding and Swedish sounding names uh, that are used. Uh, and then um, the uh, and the assumption here is that the employer they recognize these signals and they might treat uh, applicants differently because of this uh, ethnicity and gender signaled in the names. And the the second thing we're doing here, which is a bit more unusual in this type of setting, is that we are trying to see if we can sort of change our impact employer preferences by signaling in the personal ladder stereotypical femininity, masculinity being a stereotypical Swedish uh, or immigrant personality and compare that with a sort of neutral, neutral non-signal non personality. Uh, and I'm going to return to these, to these stereotypes uh, in a moment. Um, so here we're sort of thinking that employers have stereotypes. Can we change them by signaling something different or by enhancing them? Um, and uh, constructing these stereotypical personalities is a bit of a sensitive matter. Um, uh, we don't want to assume what a stereotype about a woman or a man or a Swede or an immigrant is. Um, so we did this inductively uh, by conducting this uh, sort of quantitative text analysis at Språkbanken, uh, which is this digitali digitalized uh, language corpus uh, or corpora. Uh, and uh, actually, neither Magnus nor I actually did it. It was Philip Olson, who, you, who worked for in the project at the time, who conducted this uh, study for us. Um, to sort of inductively see how are uh, men and women and, and uh, Swedes and sort of immigrants uh, talked about uh, and sort of sort of derive stereotypes from th from that. Uh, and initially we tried because we're using Arabic and Slavic names in this in this uh, study. We were looking for stereotypes about Arabic people and Slavic people, but we found that stereotypes uh, about people of a foreign background are very uh, non nuanced. So they were kind of the same. So we, di we didn't find evidence of specific stereotypes. We only found evidence of this sort of, sort of really sort of rough um, immigrant stereotype. So that's what we had to use. 
uh, and uh, it was also difficult because the immigrant stereotype was very negative. Uh, there were a few good things said about uh, immigrants in, in, in this analysis. And that's also a problem because in job applications you have to write positive things, right? Uh, nobody's writing negative things in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in, in a job application. But we did work with that and, and we ended up at something that we think worked. Um, uh, so based on, the, on those uh, analysis, we constructed a large number of personality and le leisure activity templates, um, so like descriptions. Um, and these templates were evaluated by a panel um, who rated them on masculinity, femininity, Swedishness, foreignness, uh, and employability and balance. So whether, you know, how positive uh, they were, because we wanted all of the stereotype combinations to be equally positive, because they should all be, be positive then uh, in the same way. Uh, and based on, on, on these evaluations, we, we sort of uh, removed some of those that were not uh, um, uh, unambiguously signaling what we wanted, and uh, some of those who were maybe not as positive as we uh, thought they would be. Um, so that's how we arrived at those stereotype uh, activities and personalities. Uh, right, uh, and so the correspondence audit was conducted uh, between 2020 and 2023. Um, we used a one application design, which means that we sent one application to each employer. This means that you are not sort of uh, documented discrimination at the individual level uh, with the, within each single employer, but on the aggregate. So you sort of add all of the positive callbacks for the Swedish name and the foreign name, and then you sort of compare those uh, to get the measure of discrimination. Uh, we sent out a very large number of, of applications, as you can see, over 16,000. And uh, we sent these applications to 28 occupations that varied uh, on, you know, what sector they're in, qualification level, labor demand, share women, uh, sorry, not, not share foreign born, share women, you should always say, uh, in the occupation. Uh, we, we varied uh, the gender, uh, the ethnicity, uh, that was also ran randomized to the applications. Um, yeah. Uh, and share women was um, was retrieved from Statistics Sweden. They have data on that, and the, we also randomized these stereotypical uh, masculine and feminine and so forth signals to the applications. So, um, because we could not randomize the occupations, that part is actually not uh, an experiment in the sense that it's possible that if we chose. 28 other occupations, we might get something different. Uh, and you can't randomize the occupations because we need to look at things like, you know, uh, we wanted to have this uh, th this uh, variation on, on uh, I think that's the next slide. Yeah, it is. Uh, you want to have a female dance and male dance. Uh, you want to have, you need op um, occupations where you have um, a specific, uh, sufficient callback, otherwise the design has to work and so forth. But but yeah, so we have these occupations. I don't expect you to see all of the, the text here, but what it shows is that we have uh, occupations <coughs> with a very low share of women, uh, which then of course has a, a high share of men. And we have occupations with a very high share of women, almost 100% and almost 0% of women here at the left. And we have some mixed occupations uh, as well. So, uh, to the results, finally. <laughs> Uh, is ethnic discrimination gendered? Well, yes, it is. Uh, so I'm going to begin and talk you through this, uh, starting with the inflection effect. So this is, um, so this model uh, has sort of regressed, um, shows the, the logged odd estimates of, on call of callbacks on gender and foreign name. Um, and log odds are not very intuitive to talk about, so I'm just going to talk about this in terms of the direction of the effect, if it's positive or negative, and whether it's significant. And then I'm going to show you a figure to sort of illustrate the magnitude in a clearer way. But we can, what you can see here is that the interaction effect, foreign times women, which then represents uh, women with foreign sounding names, is positive and statistically significant, which means that it comes with uh, a, a higher uh, odds then of, of callback if you carry these uh, these attributes. Um, and a woman here, because we have foreign women here, woman represents Swedish women. Uh, and they actually have a statistically significant negative uh, uh, negative coefficient here, which means that they have a lower callback rate than Swedish uh, men. 
Uh, this is not something that we've seen before uh, in these studies. So that was a little bit surprising, even if the effect is not very large, it, it's still there. Um, and then, as always in these studies, we found a negative effect for, for carrying a foreign name. And in this case, this is foreign name men, because we have women here, which means that's foreign name men. Uh, so, so, uh, so foreign named women have a, stati a statistically significantly higher um, uh, odds of, of callback than foreign named men. And I think this figure uh, is, is more easy to understand. Uh, here we see um, uh, that uh, Swedish uh, men have the highest callback. Uh, uh, they have a higher callback than Swedish named women. Uh, and um, foreign named men have the lowest callback, as you can see here. And these sort of brackets, for those of you who are not uh, accustomed to reading uh, these kind of statistical uh, figures, um, the sort of small brackets that you see here, uh, uh, they sort of um, they sort of represent uh, if they are like um, if they, they don't if they do not overlap, it means that we have a statistical significance. Uh, and as you can see here, then um, the difference between foreign named women and foreign named men is 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 statistically significant here. So we can uh, establish then that the ethnic penalty is more severe for men. Uh, the second question we ask is, are applicants rewarded for gender prototyp prototypicality, that is for occupational gender conformity, right? Uh, and again, uh, I don't know how easy you find reading this, uh, this table, but uh, what we, we have three models here, one, one with all applicants, and then uh, the second model is for Swedish names only, uh, and the third is for foreign names only. Uh, so what we find here is that uh, the is that uh, women time share women, uh, which is then uh, uh, so how, how so you, you interpret it in, in the sense that if it's positive, it means that women do have a, a high callback rate as share of women in the occupation increase, and we find uh, a positive effect for all. But when we look at model two and three, we see that it's driven by foreign names. Um, and we also see th uh, that uh, when it comes to the female coefficient, um, it's, also it's driven by Swedish names and not foreign names, which is expected because we found this uh, interaction effect in, in the first table. So I'm going to show you the um, a figure. I'm hoping you will find it uh, more intuitive. Um, and the figure shows Swedish names and foreign names because we found these differences. We think it's more interesting to look at these than the first model. Uh, and what we find here then is that uh, for Swedish names, you can see that, um, well, for, for, for all categories, you can see that they're negative because the callback rate is lower in female occupations uh, for various reasons that we don't know why. Uh, so it's easier to get a callback in a male occupation for everyone. Uh, but when we look at um, the differences uh, between Swedish named men and women and uh, they're likely the likelihood of getting a callback. You can see that woman is the red line here, so it's lower th than for men, uh, with the blue line. And if you look at the most male dense occupations, we have some kind of statistical significance here. Uh, uh, and that significance is lost as we go higher up here in share women. So in female occupations, there's no difference between Swedish uh, named men and women, but we have some difference here uh, in the most male dance occupations. So you can say that Swedish named men are rewarded for, um, for typicality, uh, but women, Swedish women are not rewarded uh, in a significant way uh, in, in, in female dance occupations. Uh, if we turn to the other um, graph, you see the actually the opposite pattern. You, you find that foreign named men are not rewarded at all, for from for gender typicality in in male dance occupations uh, but women are much rewarded uh, in female dance occupations so you find like the reverse patterns here uh, in these two which is something that we found interesting uh, to think about um, so so Swedish men are rewarded for gender typicality but not Swedish women and foreign named women are rewarded for gender typicality but not uh, foreign named uh, men yeah, this was uh, a summary of that. Um, 
and 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 the foreign and women uh, there much the pattern was much more was much stronger for for foreign and women than it was for swedish men but but nevertheless we found this pattern um right and the last question does signaling stereotypical personality influence callbacks okay this is uh, the first s uh, table. Uh, this represents um, the signals and also the interaction effect between signal and share women. Uh, and this is the female sample. Um, so all of these signals are compared against zero, which is the neutral signal, which is like just a fill out text because you want the, the, the applications to be of equal length. Uh, as you can see here, absolutely nothing is significant when it comes to to the female sample. There's no effect whatsoever of signaling anything. Uh, signaling masculinity, femininity, Swedishness, immigrantness, doesn't matter. Uh, uh, so this signal is completely inefficient in the female sample, which I find very interesting. Um, so, so uh, and, we, and it's not that no signal matters. We know that the name signal matters a lot, right? Uh, there's a signal in, in the name. Um, uh, but these signals that we are, are trying to sort of signal to the employers show nothing for the women, right? So we turn to the men. And uh, we do find something. Um, I'm not sure really, really, or we're not really sure how to make sense of this, to be quite honest. But I'm going to present it to you and maybe you can help us to understand because we're right now a little bit confused. So what we find here, if we look at the old the all men, so it's the, the, the all of the all men, uh, you find only one um, one coefficient which is uh, significant, and it's the is that signaling being an immigrant, the, the stereotypical immigrant signal uh, as share of women in the occupation increase is negative. So when so if you are um, so in female occupations, uh, this is a negative signal to have if you're a man, right? If we look at this Swedish, uh, uh, these uh, samples separated by Swedish named and foreign named, um, you find that this is the only one which is significant here also. But for the foreign named men, uh, you find something more. You find that this is significant, but you also find... So because we have this interaction effect, uh, that actually means that all of these uh, are for, for, for uh, male dance occupations. So this is when... when, when essentially when when male uh, w when there are like zero women right so there there's a very very low share of, of women in the occupation uh, this is what these coefficients represent so here uh, you have uh, then uh, that being an immigrant uh, having an immigrant stereotype stereotypical personality in a male occupation is actually positive whereas in a female dance occupation it's negative right um, and we also find that uh, signaling femininity in a male dance occupation is also positive, uh, which is very confusing, I think. Um, so one way to interpret this, I think, is that uh, for, s for, for whatever reason, employees are reacting to these stereotypical signals uh, uh, in the applications from foreign named, ma named men in a way that they don't really do for the other categories. Well, there's some reaction here uh, for the Swedish named men, but in general, I mean, the, the employers seem quite insensitive to these signals for women uh, and uh, quite ins fairly insensitive for these signals for Swedish dead men. And then they are sensitive to these signals to foreign dead men. Uh, and um, I must say that looking at the, oh uh, sorry, yeah, so this, this figure are just merely just shows uh, the most interesting effect I think we had, which is the one where you have share women in the occupation and then you have, so this is the comparison of the neutral signal and the immigrant signal for uh, foreign named men. Yeah, for foreign named men, yes. So here you see that uh, it's not significant here and as share women in the occupation increase, uh, you know, the, the, the difference uh, uh, is larger. And yeah, so this is sort of a summary of, of these two tables combined. Uh, no, but I've already summarized that, I think. Uh, but we had no effect for the female sample. Male Swedish names punished for immigrant signal in female occupations. Foreign named men are punished for immigrant signal in female occupations. And foreign named men benefit from immigrant and feminine signal in male occupations. Yeah. 
And so how would we then explain this result? I would say that they're not very easily explained by the intersectional literature, which is something that I found uh, a bit surprising. I'm not, I mean, if anything, I was expecting employee preferences for minority women to, I mean, I would not have been surprised at all if none of the signal worked for any group. That could, merely, that could mean that maybe the signals doesn't work, uh, they're not perceived by the employer, or maybe they're just insensitive to these types of, of signals because they have such strong stereotypes already that, you know, these personal ladders doesn't change anything. Um, so if, they, if we would have had a zero effect across all groups, I mean, that I would not have found that surprising. Uh, but we've seen this before, uh, that, that signals doesn't work the way you intend them to. But the fact that we found these sort of fairly strong signals for the minority men uh, suggests that the employers do read these applications and they do, it's possible to respond to these signals in some way. Uh, so then that means that the signals work, they simply did not have an effect for, sev for most of the categories. And I would have expected, because we have this, that I presented to you earlier, this discussion about um, visibility and, and invisibility. If you draw on that literature, you would assume minority women to be this invisible category. And what we know about the invisible categories is that stereotypes are more blurred, they should be more malleable. So if anything, we were expecting uh, the employers to react to these signals when applied to minority women applications, not to the minority men applications, because that's where we assume stereotypes to be more fixed and more pronounced. Uh, and that's not what we find here, we find the opposite, right? Uh, so I find that quite hard to explain. Um, so I guess we cannot really draw on this literature to understand this specific result, uh, at least not the way I see it. Uh, so really what we find, if we're trying to summarize, uh, summarize it in some more general way, is that we find that the category that suffers the most from discrimination, which is the minority men, uh, they, are, they are the ones who are influenced by these signals, both in a positive and negative way. Because as we saw, the, the, the signal was negative in female dance occupations and positive in uh, the male dance occupations. So it's not just that you, know, you, can't, go, you can't go nowhere but up, uh, it's, it's in both directions. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I would, if you have any ideas on how we can explain this in a good way that is not too post hoc, then, you know, I'd be happy to hear about it. Um, but uh, to conclude this sort of whole study, uh, and not just these last tables, um, I would say that uh, we do find support for the relevance of, of the intersectional perspective. Uh, for the first time in Swedish data, we do find a statistically significant interaction effect for the, whole s for the sample as a whole, which is not something that we've seen before. Um, I think there are, are two reasons for this. One is that we have a bigger sample than before, and the other one is that we're testing almost twice as many occupations as before, which also shows the relevance. It also shows that what, in wha what, occu what occupations you include in these studies actually matter for, for, for the result that you get, um, because the extent of discrimination do vary a bit between these, uh, these uh, studies. Uh, and uh, the second conclusion that we can draw from this is that employees do contribute to gender segregation uh, by, by preferring Swedish named men in male occupations and foreign named women in female occupations. So they don't uh, contribute to this gender segregation by like, uh, you know, b benefiting all categories, but it, uh, it is sufficient to, uh, to maintain, I think, or you do, you do maintain this, uh, this segregation by, uh, by at least partially then, uh, 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 maintaining this pattern. Uh, and finally, this confusing stereotypical personality results, uh, that, that employee callbacks are only impacted by stereotypical personality and applications sent by the most disadvantaged category, minority men. But all in all, I think the study confirms the relevance of the intersectional perspective, even though uh, we answered some questions and then we got some new questions. <laughs> but I guess that's how it is, you know, when you do research, you know. Uh, the world is never as, as neat, uh, uh, neatly sort of organized as, as you sort of uh, ideally would like it to be as a researcher. Uh, yeah, thank you.
uh, thank you very much, Mova. I think uh, we will have an, another person on stage because you're going to help answering the yes, questions. Yes, uh, and yes. also before, uh, I would also so like to say that um, the reason why we have been able to um, uh, to collect uh, 16,000, um, to, to, to have uh, 16,000 observations in this uh, study is because we've had Roy and Karakaya as our research engineer, who has sort of automated uh, the application uh, process uh, in a way that we could never have done ourselves. So thank you very much to Royan for this. Good. So we're going to get into the question and answer period. And as you know, we have an audience both online and here. And if you are online, write your question in the chat function and uh, your name and also what field you're from. And we're going to pick you up there. And we also take follow-up questions and you have to say follow-up to whoever you want to follow up to. Given that, uh, I see a number of hands. So, uh, okay, Pontus, you're first. And we're taking down your names. Very good. Thank you. This is really interesting. I'm still trying to contemplate the results. But I have a question, which is, do you know anything about the gender segregation among immigrants in these occupations? Yep. So to what extent are, are they more segregated on, among immigrants, or how are they? We have those num no. We have those numbers, but we haven't had time to look at the effects, I mean, sep or, yeah, well, maybe you did. I did. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we, I ha did. we have some figures on that. We have some figures, um, they're fairly similar, but it's, yeah, I mean, foreign, uh, so, so what we have, so we have the, the um, whether people are foreign born or, or native born, right? Uh, and it's fairly similar, but not identical to to the, the, sh the share women, uh, of course. Um, so your question was, is it more segregated or no? Right, so do uh, so these stereotypically female professions that have a high share of women, yeah. uh, do immigrants tend to be even more stereotypical so that it's only immigrant women there or are they, because they have a hard time getting into the labor market, less? So, so kind yeah, of if, yeah, you yeah. if you have, this is yeah. the Swedish, do, do mm. they have a sharper or, yeah? My, my guess would be that those yeah, that, that there is more gender segregation among immigrants. That that would be my guess, but I I have no proof for this. I guess um, so. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, that that would be the the expectation at least. Uh, and maybe employers contribute to that larger segregation. This is speculation, but Th there's yeah. also the um, there are some. Uh, gender segregated high school occupations where uh, foreign born women are not as represented. So, I mean, they are more concentrated also to the low skilled occupations. Yeah. Could Just we have a follow extent. up this if you pass the microphone? Thank you very uh, much. Wait for the microphone. Great study, but also a, um, a great question because there are certain of the sectors are very heavily populated, not only by gender, but also by, if you just want to call it, born outside of Sweden. I mean, it, it, it's not very fine-grained. <laughs> um, but I was also, okay, and I, that was just a follow-up. But, th but it, there are very good statistics on foreign-born at different levels of education, everything in the SCB sectors. Yeah, yes. It would be interesting to, to compare that as well. Yeah, I, thi I think our plan is to conclude. We, we have, we did run, we're going to have to make it more carefully, but I mean, we, ha we did run some, we have that data. Uh, and we probably, my sense was that uh, it didn't show much more than this, but we're probably going to include them in the appendix because it's a very sort of natural next question to ask. Uh, it's a so, so I mean, it's a good question. I think, I think if I'm going to predict what the paper is going to look like, I think those analyses might be included, but I think they'll be in the appendix because they don't show something much different uh, from this. Good. Then to be us next. Yeah, uh, this is just a reflection given the results that you presented and your kind of question marks to mm. us. Um, uh, when it comes to um, the, the, the minority groups that you chose, the Slavic and the Arabic mm. minorities, basically, um, my immediate reflection is that, and this is according to my own ethnic and racial stereotypes, of course, but 
uh, that both these groups, uh, they are big, right? Uh, demographically speaking, they are really big. So they are relevant uh, in all respects, but they are also both, uh, in both cases, I would claim, um, seen as um, uh, masculinized, right? They are heavily masculinized. I even the women are, Slavic women and, and Arabic women. Uh, although, of course, when it comes to Arabic Muslim women, there's another story going on there as well. And maybe that might be one, at least one explanation for your results. Uh, and this also means that if you had picked two other minority groups, or even more minority groups, it might have been different, but I don't know. It's just something that I, yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say that I agree that uh, women from the Middle East are masculinized, uh, that there's a stereotype that they're more masculine uh, than Swedish women. I'm not sure I, I would agree with that. Um, I thought you said Slavic, what did you say? Muslim. S Slavic. Yeah, Slavic. Um, but I mean, it, it's it's possible. We, we maybe we should look into that, or maybe we should have looked into that when we constructed our our stereotypes. Um, it gets very complex when you. <laughs> so we we decide not to. But 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 I I I I don't personally recognize a masculinized stereotypes or stereotype of uh, women from the Middle East in Sweden. That, that's, I don't know if... I think it's, it's very hard to say, but I think in, in general, of course, if we're going to draw on this intersectional literature, then of course all, all minority groups are, should then be masculinized in a sense, because they are, they are like the ideal type of a man. So like, I mean, like the Eagle and Kite study that we like, there's a, there's a, a study from the 80s uh, by um, Eagle and Kite, I don't remember their first name, where they, they make this lab experiment and they ask students, it's always students in these psychology experiments, they, they ask them to, to combine um, uh, stereotypes uh, with different nationalities. And half of the students, they got to, 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 uh, label, to put labels on women uh, representing like Iran, Sweden, Norway, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, South Africa, whatever. Uh, and half of them got to uh, label the same um, sort of stereotypes to male ex exemplars of these groups. Um, and the result was that the men, the men were much, the, the results for the men were much more extreme. So, so, so the men were like, uh, you know, uh, more, more extreme on those and the women were like more clustered together sort of because they were like, so the interpretation was that they're influenced by both the national stereotype and the female stereotype, right? So they were more clustered together and the men were more extreme, which means then that if you have positive stereotypes put on you, then it's a good thing to be a man. And then if you have negative stereotypes, it's a bad thing to be a man, but it's all driven by men. And, and it, because men are also me <laughs> masculine, then that then stereotypes should always, stereotypes about the other ethnic group should always be masculine and then slightly less masculine for the women, but the women will always be then have the, the too little femininity in a sense. I know that this th this perspective has been questioned. Uh, Cecilia, Ri Cecilia Ridgeway is writing about this in the U.S. context, where she's arguing that uh, in this specific context, for different uh, historical reasons, uh, Asians are really the, the the first image that comes to the American mind when you talk about Asians are women. So they are like the prototype for Asians in the US. And that results in Asian men being stereotyped as too feminine, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, it's co I think it's, it's complex and it's, it, it's a not a good idea to be too general about these things. But I think you come quite a long way by, by, by drawing on this uh, masculine ethnic norm. Uh, it does not work in all cases, but it's kind of, which means then that women uh, speaking, so, so then women should always, minority women are n never have the sort of just right femininity. They're always a little bit too masculine in some way, right? Uh, so I mean, but yeah, it's it's complicated. I've also been surprised, and I think you've been too, that when you when, w uh, when I've been choosing ethnic groups for these co uh, correspondence audits, I'm always expecting a more pronounced difference between the ethnic gr minority groups. But I mean, in this study, we did find a significant effect almost, I think, between Slavic and Arabic names. 
but I think that maybe because we had so many uh, occupations, um, such large sample in the past, we haven't found that. I mean, when I did my study, my PhD, I used African and Arabic names, did not find a significant effect uh, in callback between these two, and you didn't find one in your first study with Slavic and Arabic names either. No, it's it's surprising that it's so so similar. So yeah. uh, you would expect more discrimination against people from the Middle East compared to. Uh, former Yugoslavia, you would mm. think, but mm. that's not really what we see. We see less discrimination against uh, women from uh, former Yugoslavia in this, but we we haven't shown that, but that we we see that. Yeah, but that's it. Mm. Was there a follow up there? Yeah. There. Yeah, I, so now I I'm getting I losing a little bit. So is the follow up there, and also follow? follow, -up? follow -up. Okay, are you new question? Uh, but okay. Can I? <laughs> <laughs> and then you are, are you cutting uh, your? <laughs> Because you're next for the main question. So you yeah, can it's related to this. Ah, okay, very good. First follow up. Uh, yeah. Just a question on, to me it seems like you're, uh, I mean it's a first cut in a sense, but it's very at a general level. And I, I'm questioning, you know, the equating language or name to ethnicity, to born outside what is an immigrant. It's so much more complex, <laughs> it seems to me. Um, the biggest groups that we've been having for years now have been Indians, for example, coming to Sweden. So I, I, I'm just I'm wondering how much can we take from you know your study at a universal level to understand what's going on, given that there's so much more complexity in very heterogeneous groups of immigrants. I mean, if we look at so, so the people, of course, uh, you know, you, you you could choose what we what we want to do in this. way we want to have uh, groups that I think one of my 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 regrets from my first correspondence audit that I did with the Arabic and African names was that I'm not sure at all that the employers understood the ethnic signal for the Arabic for the African names. Um, so I don't know if the, if whether it was just some somebody being foreign or or just you know. If they really understood that this was, you know, uh, uh, where this name was sort of coming from, right? So you want um, the signals to be unambiguously um, uh, interpreted, uh, and for that you need well-known groups. And you're talking about Indians, but if you look at demographically at the proportion of different uh, groups in Sweden, Indians is still a very small group. Uh, Arabic and Slavics are by far the, the largest, largest, and they've been here for a long time. So employers know their names. They know what they see, uh, and also we are uh, looking at people who, because we don't want to want to measure discrimination against immigrants, we want to look at uh, discrimination against ethnic minorities. Uh, and so these sort of uh, fictive people, they have their high school education from Sweden to the extent that they've had that they have, uh, they might be immigrants, but if they are, they come in an early age because they have sec they, ha they have high school from here and university and so forth. But that's why I asked what yes. So I mean, we're not really uh, defining ethnicity. We're using these names uh, that have a back that, that have a background in these regions. It's the employers. We don't. It's the employers who are responding to this. I don't think we really have to. Of course, we have to talk about it in some way here. But it's it's not there. It's not. I mean, when you apply for a job, if 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 a, if a real person applies for a job, uh, how what what your ethnicity is. It's it's what you feel, right? In your your social identity, what the employer sees might be something else. You know, it's the perceived ethnicity, in, in what the, what they see when when they when they read the application, right? Um, sometimes there is an overlap between these two things, and sometimes you know there's not. Uh, so we think that employers see Slavic and Arabic names uh, in a fair in sort of fairly the same way. When they see the Slavic names that we chose, I should maybe have uh, had a slide on them, but I don't. I forgot that. They see uh, they see applicants from the sort of former Yugoslavian region, uh, when when they see the Arabic names, they probably think about the Middle East, because that's sort of the type of names that we've chosen uh, here. Th you know, the real ethnicity of I mean, these people don't exist, and we don't know what they. You know, but that's what we think. The, the implicit. Uh, definition would be second generation immigrants uh, or maybe first generation but most likely second generation immigrants because they have impeccable Swedish in their job applications and they have their education in Sweden so that that would then 
Sorry, sorry. We have to use sorry? microphones when we ask questions because otherwise the recording doesn't work. So please, you can ask another follow-up question again. Thanks. Me, you were not finished. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th that's the implicit, and, and as Moa said, it's it's built into the name, and whatever that means to people when they read these uh, applications. So yeah. And then we had a follow-up up now. Yeah. Um, well, I'm gonna stand up. I'm really, really. Um, it was really, really interesting, and my follow-up was also connected to these different groups, like Slavs versus, what was it, Arabic-sounding uh, names. Mm -hmm. And like from my own um, research on like, at least like Ukrainians, Russians, and Poles, we know that these um, were mostly women who came in 80s and 90s, so they are pretty integrated. And then the new ones who came, um, and our men, they would, from my interviews, at least, what I see is that, you know, men who end up, for example, at construction work. And there, the preference is for Poles uh, from the employees or for, for Russians or for people who speak Russian because it's easier than for the team. So I'm thinking, I don't know much about the Arabic um, sounding, like, workplaces and so on, but I'm thinking there, there should be some sort of gendered... Um, network effect of also like you know you just employ people who you have employed before because they were like from Poland and it's cheaper and then if a Polish sounding name applies to your job then you have this assumption from you know these network uh, ways of hiring people so it's curious for me that you don't see because you answered a little bit my uh, my question that you don't really see the difference between the Slavic names and the Arabic names because I would guess there is a different um, like scheme of getting these type of jobs, if you get what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. It might it might very well be that you we would find this in specific occupations. If we look at carpenters, we might find it, but it might also be a, a selection in terms of what companies um, put job ads on Platzbanken. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a selection in that too. That so it might not be like completely representative of the car of all the carpenter firms you know, that uh, are out there. Uh, you know, th it might be that those who prefer Polish workers might, m might, to a large extent, use social networks to, to uh, uh, so I mean, you don't get a completely representative picture of, I mean, these are the jobs that are public and uh, publicly announced that you can apply for. Uh, that's probably, um, estimates usually say that that's around 30% of all the vacancies. So I mean, you have 70% of the vacancies that are not sort of covered uh, in, in job ads. Thank you. A follow up from Pontus and then one more follow up on this question. So, microphone is coming. I mean, it's similar to your answer, but I, we have research on uh, um, where we let ethnical Swedes guess the opinions of migrants. And similar to your finding is that we don't find much difference depending on which country we say that the migrants are from. So, while ethnicity might be very complex, uh, Ethnic born Swedes' view of ethnicity isn't very complex. <laughs> if anything, <laughs> it's oversimplified. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Okay. I, I had a very simple follow up on this because y you talked about it now many times. I wonder how you know uh, how these signals go through, and you talk about uh, what the employers see and things like that. And some probably something very simple to answer. I just wonder how you know this ab about that they can actually distinguish between these different kind of signals or. Or is that rather something that you refer because you see a difference and then you think, okay, they see a signal? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, so in, in the case, of course, I, I was referring to my, to my first study when I was yeah. using the African and the Arabic names. I can't know. Huh. Maybe, they, maybe, this, maybe they interpreted the signal correctly and there was no difference uh, in callbacks anyway, right? That, that, that's quite possible. Uh, but it's also possible that, that um, I should, I mean, I, this was the first time I did the study. These type of studies had never been done in Sweden before. Mm. Uh, today, like I was mentioning with the, the, this pre-study where we evaluated the signals, mm. if I'd done that, I would have known, right? I should have done that, mm. uh, you know. Uh, so that's why, that's so that's what you do when you want to sort of increase the chances of the signals going through because employers are not that different from, I mean, they're just people, right? Yeah. Um, they are t people that are probably more aware uh, that, that because they meet a lot of different people. Uh, they might have more pronounced stereotypes than people in average, uh, on average. 
Uh, but you know they are normal people. Uh, so you conduct a pre-study to, to see whether your signals work, and then you hope that they also work in this other context. I mm. mean that's uh, as far as you can sort of go. Yeah. Uh, so when you say employer C, that's a little bit kind of inferred from some difference in the in the pre-study. Yeah, yeah. Okay, in yeah. The pre -study. And yeah. also like I was, I was talking about the signals. If I would have had a zero effect for all mm. groups, then you could say okay maybe the signals doesn't work. Mm. But because there was effects for one of the categories then you know I guess uh, so. yeah we, we also know that the signals work because we have signaled um, aggressivity so mm. really aggressive personality wi which then lowers mm. the, the callback rate significantly so in a previous study yeah yeah, yeah. in, in, in yeah. another study so, so <laughs> yeah. they, they, okay, they actually okay. read the application yeah, so yeah. yeah. but okay. yeah but the signal has have to be overly clear uh, otherwise <laughs> uh, they might not be seen because employers are screening these applications quite fast so I mean, if you're too subtle, it doesn't work. We've seen that before as well. Uh, yeah. So it's a lot of work with sort of calibrating these signals to be clear, but not crazy in an application, so to speak. Very good. So then we have next uh, Andre. So you send the microphone back, Pontus. You can't hog the microphone. You have to send it back. Thank you. Uh, this was amazingly interesting. So. Uh, you were thinking about your interpretation, but for me it was quite like in line with your visibility theory, right? Because if we have stronger, if, if immigrant men are the carriers of, of prejudice or of stereotypes, then of course when they signal the opposite of being that stereotype or they signal anything, that's when you react. Because as an employer, if you think it's visibility, then, oh, immigrant man, I have this stereotype about him. I might actually read and, and think about what the application says. But if some kind of an invisible minority, then I don't even know what to infer from these different signals. So that's kind of, a, I would think that would be intuitive. But I had also a question that, so your idea, as I understand it, is that gendered occupations in connected with ethnicity and gender kind of uh, signals and gender, right? But if I remember your first figure correctly on this share of women, because this is what you use as gender occupation, on the very far right you had both a preschool teacher, which is I assume very gendered also in its uh, content, and you have financial assistant, which is harder to argue, has some kind of a like caregiving like content, wherever. So I think, why don't you use also more of a structural feature of these occupations as how much care or work with people or wherever uh, they content and do that interaction rather than just share of, of women. Mm, that's, that's a good idea. Uh, we haven't done that, but we could definitely do that and see if. Yeah, if yeah, it's mm. worth looking at. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and and I like your your uh, your um, suggestion for explanation. Um, I, I will think about it. I, I think m my first idea that comes to mind is that it makes sense, but it's hard to understand why uh, the stereotypical immigrant signal would be positive in male occupations. Uh, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll take that with us. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Karim, the microphone is somewhere. Yeah. Thanks. Um, this uh, this was super interesting, and I was actually going to ask something that was very similar to Andre's question uh, about the content of the occupation, and maybe that you know, care care work is uh, well, it's female coded, and and that um, uh, yeah, connecting to 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 be as uh, common too that that uh, um, for uh, Arabic and Slavic ethnicity. Uh, Signal some kind of hyper masculinity and therefore, but so so let me ask a, a, a slightly different question, uh, and that would be um, that um, um, uh, whether um, how, how this invisible and visibility uh, thing uh, works. Um, how how would you say if we added a third dimension of um, minority, like homosexual, for example, uh, and to what extent can is this generalizable? I mean, I, so I, I, I try to come up with a counterexample, but I couldn't come up with one. But uh, yeah, so any thoughts about that? Like, what what makes a category 
what what makes someone become invisible? Uh, uh, yeah, it does get very complicated where, when you add like multiple, like really like more than two identities. I think I think the general answer would be from this literature that if if you uh, if you're gonna be if you're gonna be the representative of of uh, uh, of uh, you know heterosexuality or homosexuality, uh, you have to be a white man, right? That's the representative of sort of th that's the the, the typical uh, homosexuality norm. It's the white male uh, homosexual, uh, and so they are the ones that we think about when we want to improve things, and they are the ones who are the primary targets of of uh, uh, of uh, of, uh, of uh, attacks uh, and, and, and homophobia. There is an interesting study by David Pedula in the US, US setting where he is doing a, a correspondence audit on, on um, where he's comparing callbacks for white and black homosexual men. So he's signaling also homosexuality in the job applications. And he finds that, uh, I think if I even finds that, I don't remember if he finds that black men are they're not the most popular category, but they are much more popular than heterosexual black men, right? They are probably seen then as less, less masculine and less threatening in that sense. So I mean, you do find that. Um, s um, so, but yeah, but if s let's say that you have two disadvantaged identities, uh, what are you rep what what are you representing then? I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, it does get very complicated. I agree with you. We, I mean, we signal masculinity and femininity, so we could maybe use that as a kind of proxy for, uh, well, not a stereotypical identity, maybe. Uh, so maybe that would then explain that uh, <laughs> uh, immigrant men who are interested in like yoga and home decoration are popular than in male dominated <laughs> occupations because they think that this is a fun type or just a peculiar kind of person and that way you escape the negative stereotype. So maybe that could be, uh, I don't yes. know if it's far-fetched or, or yes. yeah, it's uh, some kind of, of uh, explanation or, or uh, narrative here that we can use. So I just a follow up on that. Um, I, 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 uh, I seem to remember that from your previous work, uh, where you had um, uh, Arabic and African names um, for men, uh, there was a, a significant difference in callback rates uh, depending on whether the profession was um, you know, required a university degree uh, versus if it required um, like um, no, no degree at all, like uh, with with uh, immigrant men. So the the, the callback rate ver versus Swedish men was almost the same when it came to like uh, uh, labor um, labor laborer or uh, gen I mean, uh, uh, janitorial work or s stuff like that but but uh, when it came to lawyer and um, uh, accountant and so on uh, there was a big difference uh, so uh, so I don't remember that slide with the different uh, male dominated occupations but um, but we know that there's a, a large uh, pol um, polarization in, in male uh, dominated occupations. So you have some such occupations that are um, low status or uh, that don't require a, a col college degree, and then you have male occupations that are very well paid. Uh, so uh, could that part of that polarization explain the patterns that you see that perhaps uh, immigrant men that are more uh, into, I don't know, yoga and bonsai trees are, are, are more. Uh, uh, Acceptable to to uh, managerial work and and the um, the uh, immigrant men or Arabic men that that like boxing and uh, uh, I don't know uh, kick, uh, I don't know uh, typical yeah. male stuff uh, maybe Bas they're more yeah, yeah, yeah basketball yeah. they're maybe more like oh this is mm. a good construction worker eh, because he can uh, yeah, you know yeah. toil it <laughs> yeah we we haven't looked at that yet I think. Uh, I mean, we could sort of divide them into high and low skill or something like that. Uh, the signals. I don't think we analyzed the signals by by uh, skill yet, but we could we could look at that. We we've done a study of skill, but we didn't actually find any any difference of, of the kind that you you mentioned. So it's 
discrimination is very similar across skill levels. So. Hi, thank you for this. Um, I was curious, so in terms of a kind of intersectional analysis, and I'm very far away from a quantitative sociologist, so if this is outside your study, I, I apologize in advance. I was curious about, I mean, some of these things could read as sort of class factors, like yoga versus boxing, but I was actually curious about the addresses you use when you uh, use these fake applicants, because it, it seems that there's a kind of question about class in terms of housing segregation and that certain addresses could signal a kind of more quote-unquote assimilated uh, immigrant of either gender versus uh, applying from a kind of stereotypically uh, immigrant area. So I was curious, that was question one about sort of housing as a kind of vector for class. And then I also, sorry I have two, uh, was wondering about uh, more temporary forms of employment in some of the industries. I don't know what shows up on Platzbanken, but uh, sort of consultants or uh, deco type work, if you see any distinction in your results between sort of formal permanent employment and, and more kind of fill-in types of jobs, if those come up at all. Uh, the question about class is very, very, I mean, interesting. We they live in middle class, like uh, not suburbs or close to the, you know, newly built Hanby Sjöstad and uh, Liljeholmen, or, or yeah, what was it? I think so. But but but, but yeah, in the past, I I I, I t in my in my first uh, correspondence audit, I did actually um, test for for class. I, I wrote this very typical like like low studies and and high studies addresses and schools into the um, and around my statue, I didn't mention it in my publications because uh, there was absolutely no effect whatsoever, um, which surprised me. But it's it's quite hard to to signal class. Uh, but I thought that was clear signals, but that did not impact at all. Um, there are a few studies internationally that have found some class effects, uh, but we didn't find that here. So that's why we didn't really vary this uh, in, in the coming in the experiments after that because you know it wasn't worth the I mean there was a zero effect but I mean it's it, it could be that uh, I mean if you signal a gender stereotypical personality maybe that's lower class so maybe we catch mm. some of that uh, yeah yeah that's yeah yeah it's hard to it's hard to distinguish these uh, these from each other uh, Unfortunately, we have run out of time, so join me in thanking Moa for this brilliant talk, and Moa and Magnus for all the answers. <laughs> and the next uh, uh, thank you for good is uh, Klaus Lörstedt, Professor of Penal Law from Stockholm University, and Frankenstein Shares, I don't know really what it's about. <laughs> and then we have uh, Johanna Rickne, 27th of March, on the class ceiling in politics. You're very welcome. <laughs>